have Bill and we have, uh, we have Mark, who are two Leica Academy instructors, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, first thing is, um, don't forget uh, our newsletter. Um, if you sign up to our newsletter through the, web the website, then you get to hear about these webinars weekly, uh, whichever the next one is. So that would be a great thing to do. Go to the website, sign up for that, uh, and you'll be kept informed. And the second thing I'd like to bring to your attention is the YouTube channel, which we have done a lot of work on in the last couple of weeks. There's now a whole bucket load of videos on there. Um, and you can go to, uh, it's like a camera Australia channel. You can search for that and uh, you can subscribe to that. And as we're getting a lot of traffic on that, there's about 30 or 40 videos on there now, uh, tips and tricks, uh, products, um, settings for cameras, um, technical stuff, uh, creative stuff. There's an interview with Mark on there. I'm going to do Bill next week and Jesse and so on. So it'll all be building up. All right. So gentlemen, how are we all? Everyone good? Good. Night. Good. Good. Okay. So I'm going to start with that uh, with Mark. Um, Mark Strawn is one of our Leica Academy instructors and a very successful studio photographer in the field of portraiture. That's his, his, his genre, his oeuvre at the moment. So, Mark, could you maybe just introduce yourself for a couple of minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself and your, uh, your background? Sure. I uh, got my first camera when I was seven years old and I was instantly hooked. Um, had my studio when I was 16, so I started my studio when I was 16 years old. It's now been 38 years and uh, wow. haven't gotten sick of it yet. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Every week presents a new challenge, so uh, it keeps me excited. Good stuff. And Bill, Bill Green is a photographer from Sydney. I've known Bill for, crikey, how long is it now, Bill? It must be 30 no, years. No, as long as you think it is, Nick. It's, <laughs> it's a long time. And um, Bill and Bill's done, well, there's not a lot that Bill hasn't done in his career, I don't think. So maybe you could give us a little bit of a quick overview of your background and where, you, where you've come from over the years. I think it's easy to say I haven't done still life, that's for sure. But uh... Yeah, okay, so um, I came from London um, about 30 years ago, and I was an assistant in London for lots of photographers. Uh, I also went to college to do photography, and I came over here and started up over here. Um, since coming, I've done a lot of editorial work, a lot of magazine work, portraiture mainly, um, lots of music. Um, I guess celebrity portrait, you could probably say I've done a lot of that. Yeah. And also, um, I think probably... Yeah, I mean, some film stills, just people in general. I mean, anything to do with people. That's yeah, I think really... so. It's fair to say that you both photograph mostly people. Is that reasonable? Yeah. 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 And yeah. I think I'd like to sort of put it to you guys that I think people photography is possibly one of the more challenging aspects of photographic, um, you know, all the different things you can do with a camera, really. Would you agree with that? Certainly. I think it's, uh, for me, I love it that no two assignments are the same. You're, you're dealing with different personalities. And uh, in many cases, many different confidence levels too. Some people are very, um, very reluctant to be in front of a camera. So I love the challenge of, of having them leave the session, uh, feeling like it was a lot more fun than what they're anticipating. Yeah, I, I think people photography is quite challenging. You never know who's going to come through the door. You don't know what mood they're going to be in. You don't know what they're <laughs> going to bring to the session. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Sometimes there's other people in the room, like an art director or something, and you know, there's lots of distractions and you've got to really focus um, and get to what you want and, and trying to get to where you want to go with the photo um, with all the stuff that's going on around can be quite difficult sometimes. Okay. So if you were to pick one aspect of port, not so much portraiture, but people photography, so including portraiture, what would you say would be the, the single most important thing that makes a good per people picture actually work? What, 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 what's, what, what gives it that bit of extra something that makes it, you know, really good? Well, from my perspective, the thing I think that makes makes a great portrait is is revealing not just how somebody looks, but just trying to bring something of who they are out to the fore. So, scratching past the surface, and I guess yeah, Bill's photographed a lot more celebrities than I have. Uh, I know when I photographed celebrities, there's very much a public persona they wear or a, a garment they wear on the outside. Uh, I'm always trying to scratch below that and uh, and bring a bit of the inner person out. And uh, a lot more of my clients are not, not celebrities so much. They're more everyday people. So um, I enjoy just getting past the initial innovation, inhibitions they've got mm -hmm. and getting through to the real core of who they are and, and making that into a picture. 
Yeah. Sense. I, Bill, how, how do you feel about that? I'd agree with what Mark was saying there, especially um, when you photograph famous people. They're used to being in front of the camera. Um, they've got a particular look that they're trying to promote. Um, it seems to be a look they've actually practiced, and that's what they're trying to put out there. And you often get that photo quite easily. Um, mm. And then trying to get something more from them can be quite challenging. And in fact, sometimes the people in the room with them, like a public sister or whatever might actually resist getting something else because they're not comfortable with them being seen in a new way but if you can get a photograph that's a little bit different that you're happy with and they're happy with i think mm. you're really winning in that situation so, well, with, when you're photographing celebrities in, in that sense that they've got a, a persona they want to put forward they've got an image they want to manage but you do try to break through that do you find that the celebrities themselves are more open to that than the publicists or sometimes are the, are the, the is it the other way around I think the publicists are the biggest problem. Um, <laughs> I was, I was I saying mean, for that because I think that's. I mean, cool. coming into a room, um, there's the person that you relate to. Um, they're wary or guarded about their image, but yeah. then it's the people that are protecting their image that seem they seem to protect the image as if it was their own image they're protecting, which is quite funny sometimes. I, I do remember sort of um, meeting Pink's publicist, who was really quite horrible. Pink was delightful, but Pink's publicist was just so so difficult and you keep thinking why are you getting in the way of what we're meant to be doing here you know it's that sort of stuff really just uh, i just had a question from rosalie nielsen i'm very loud apparently so let me just drop my volume back a little bit there we go how's that no oh, I, I, okay so you guys are a little bit quiet could you can maybe speak a little bit louder. Bill and Mark are louder than you. Yeah, I'm too quiet still. Okay, so getting a bit of feedback here. So you guys are a little bit loud, and I'm a little bit, I'm a bit, a little bit quiet. So I'm going to pop up my. Maybe you guys could just speak a little bit quieter, and I'll pop up my volume, which is about as far as it will go. Hopefully that's better. It's really hard to uh, to mix three different microphones when they're on three different, we're in three different parts of the country. Bill's in Sydney. Uh, I'm in Brisbane and, and Mark's in Melbourne or Geelong. So uh, hopefully that's a little bit better there. All right. So look, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, a few people emailed them in early uh, and I've got a, a bunch coming in as we speak. So I'm going to start off with the ones that were emailed in. So uh, in order of, well, no particular preference, but let's do it in time order. So um, the first one was from Richard Bowden. It's a fairly long one, but it's got, it will raise some interesting issues. Now, uh, to be fair, we'll, we'll answer these questions in as much detail as possible, but I'm mindful that there are plenty of people asking questions. So if we, you know, cut it off a little bit shorter, just, you know, for, forgive us for that. Um, to do with Leica lenses specifically, um, Richard wants to know about uh, the fact, it, it's, it's something Peter Carver, our, our Leica senior lens designer, has, has, has said many times over the years. And he, he suggests that we should always use Leica lenses wide open. Now, um, he says, uh, Richard says, this is obviously going to give good results for portraits and separating objects from their backgrounds, but I assume it's equally obvious that open wide is not a sensible approach for landscape, cityscape, and scenes which cannot be condensed down to particular objects or people. Can you give some guidance about the circumstances in which to use a good fast lens wide open or conversely at, at, a, at a narrower aperture? Anybody got any comments on that? Yeah, probably. I'll go first, if yeah. that's okay. Yeah, um, with, for me, if I'm photographing an individual person, I'm like making a portrait of a single person, um, I can, and I'm using available light, for example, I can I can shoot wide open. Uh, I've got the Noctilux, which I use uh, for that uh, at times. And um, it's great when you're dealing with one person, but because I have a passion for having the eyes pin sharp, if I'm photographing more than one person, it becomes particularly challenging to use uh, a lens certainly at, at 50 yeah. mil or longer uh, yeah. wide open because you have a very very limited amount of in focusness uh, yeah. depth yeah. of field so um so I, I absolutely i agree with using a, a a lens like that wide open when you're shooting one person um but when you're shooting more than one person it just becomes challenging to get uh, get two planes of focus working for you Mm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, it's great that you can use lenses like that. It's, you know, there are some lenses that are very wide open lenses and they're not sharp wide open, which is really horrible. That's very disappointing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's when you do, we, uh, the Leica lenses are designed to be 
sharp yeah. wide open is what you pay for so yeah. this is it's like mark was saying about the noctilux you you pay all that money why not use it at 0.95 but i think i don't know if you guys agree but i i find it becomes addictive and you tend to shoot everything like that do you, do you do that as well well i find that when it comes to even a studio or something like that it depends on what you're looking for the look that you want i mean mm. if you're mm. using something equivalent to a 90 mil lens there's not much depth of field on it to start with Mm, and mm. by the time if someone turns their head and you're doing a close-up head and shoulders, the eyes are already out of focus, mm, like mm. completely. And yeah. that is something that you don't always want. So if you need the eye to be in focus and you need a certain amount of the face to be in focus, and that might be a, a client's brief to have a certain look, yeah. then you can need to close down. I think um, what, one, one of the comments that I make to, to people in my live workshops when I get this question, and I tend to not worry about the number I either go with not much depth of field or quite a bit. <laughs> I don't care whether it's 5.6 or 6.7. It's like as little as possible or plenty. Uh, I, that's the way I approach it. Mark, do you, do you find that works for you? But if I'm photographing a group of people, of course I want to try and maintain my focus from, from front to back. Mm. Um, and that's exa what you're saying exactly right. I don't tend not to use more depth of field than I need, um, mm. but at the same time, I'm shooting ultra wide or shooting a large group and wanting to get, say, an interior of a... Of a um, a home or a, a workplace in focus, I'll, I'll, I'll go for a smaller aperture to carry that depth mm -hmm. through. But um, by and large, as much as you need and no more, really, um, I tend, you know, with the Nocti, you said about the Nocti before the Noctilux, um, I reckon I could almost gaffer tape that, that aperture open because that's the only place I use that lens. <laughs> Right. Fair enough too. Now, Richard actually has a second a follow up question here, which I can probably answer fairly briefly. Um, and for non professionals, would the panel recommend setting the camera to sRGB or Adobe RGB? Um, some experts have suggested that the S in sRGB stands for satanic. Now, I know precisely who you're referring to. That would have to be Les Walkling because that's one of his expressions. Personally, I call sRGB safe RGB because you can't go too far wrong with it. But if you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't actually matter because you choose that color space later. So without drilling down into what color spaces are, if you're shooting RAW, the choice of sRGB or Adobe RGB is irrelevant at the shooting stage because you can actually change that later for whatever reasons. So my advice to people, which does not conflict with uh, Les's directly, is to, is to shoot RAW and hedge your bets. And there's nothing wrong with sRGB in principle. It's not as good as it could be. The colors aren't as good as they could be, but they are very, very predictable and safe. So I would, yeah, but don't worry about it as a camera setting. All right, now then, that's Richard. Um, then we had a question from Tim Bauer, who came in with a, a reasonably long list of questions. So I'll just whiz through them reasonably smartly to do. He was referring to a video which popped up on, um, uh, I think through, the Leica USA, uh, we shared a picture, a, a video of Pete Turnley uh, working in New York uh, doing street photography during the, the coronavirus crisis. And it's a, a beautiful series of images that he's put to music and was um, somebody brought it to my attention uh, yesterday. And then the email from, um, from uh, his email turned up. And he said he's been doing a lot of work on using his M10 and 35mm 1.4. Um, I think he uses, so this is Tim speaking, I think he uses silver FX or similar. Um, can you guys talk about what you use for post-processing black and white images? So Mark, when you go to black and white, what, what, what do you do? Uh, I use silver FX Pro occasionally. Um, I tend to be pretty basic with the way I do my post-production. I tend to t treat Photoshop like a darkroom in effect. So. Um, I pretty much use density and, and contrast um, and, and maybe a bit of cropping, but, but really don't do anything too tricky. Um, mm. I do like to get nice, nice, rich blacks. I like to get highlights that aren't blown out, uh, all the things that lovely black and white people like to get. Um, but I don't tend to faff about too much with black and whites. I like to get rid of the colour, obviously, and I do shoot a lot of my, uh, my camera profiles are set up for yeah, black and white. I've so I've got one of your pictures here, which is black and white. I'm just going to flick to if i may there's a picture here which uh i'm gonna <laughs> actually that's black and white film um this one here which i know i'm just going to share this give me a moment this picture here you talked about the other day and um you can everyone see that okay yes yep. yeah yep. so that that is that a conversion from color because it's a lovely tonality it's actually a, a shot from a monochrome so the uh ah, well there the, we go yeah, version yeah. one so the the M9 monochrome, um, yeah. and um, and that's basically 
straight out of camera with just some density and some and some some tweaking with the contrast, but yeah. Yeah, mm. not much more played with. Right. Yeah. The mono, well, obviously the monochrome is designed for this specifically. I'll come yeah. back to you guys. Okay. Um, all right. And Bill, how do you how do you approach black and white yourself? I'm not shooting too much black and white actually with digital. Um, I used to shoot nearly all black and white with film mm. for a long time. Um, and I really like that process, but I don't do too many conversions to black and white at the moment. That's something I'm thinking of doing a bit more okay, with, but um, having said that, I'm, I would love to have a monochrome because um, it just, it's so amazing from what I've seen. It'd be great. Yeah, it is, it is pretty special. Um, Tim also goes on to ask what's, uh, what particular models of camera we're using. What's in your kits? Any special things? Are you using your M cameras on a tripod much? Um, I'll answer for myself for the moment. I'm using the SL2 mostly and the CL. Uh, I don't shoot a lot with the I don't own an M myself. Um, I, I've used them quite a bit, but I've gone with the SL2 over the M for practical reasons. Uh, I find the M an exquisite camera to use, but I find it uh, a little bit less um, practical, shall we say. It's a little bit of an indulgence for me. It's not the sort of stuff I do, which is commercial documentary work. You, you got, I, I, I'm not quite as nimble with the M10 as I would like to be, shall we say. But I know uh, Mark's been shooting with the Ms quite a lot over the years. And do you, uh, Mark, do you use the M for commercial work much? Um, it depends on, on the subject. If I'm photographing a, a, like a portrait session with one or two people, no children, uh, I'll use the M because it's a bit manual focus. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love the fact that it's a very unobtrusive camera. It's uh, also a bit of a quirky camera to use too because people are expecting yeah. you to roll up with a huge DSLR. And, and um, I love working, working with it because it's a nice, simple simple process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, with that being said, I do use the SL as well. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to use the SL if I've got fast breaking movement and action because I just love the, the fact that the AF uh, will follow my subject. Hmm. Um, but, that, but the M's, I've used them since the 90s. Uh, I love them. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I've used the M, but I'm not that familiar with it. It's not my, you know. Well, Bill, you've kind of gone a little bit like myself in like a middle ground because the, yeah. the, the CL, which is what you use, is, hmm. is like a mini SL but it's also the same sort of sim a similar size and, and, and portability to the M system. And how do you find the results out of the CL at the moment? Are you happy with them? Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, it, you know, it's a crop sensor camera, but the lenses are fantastic and the look it gives is wonderful. I'm very mm. impressed with it. But mm. I think the thing for me is that it is so small mm. and just it's so portable. And especially if I want to go out and take photos for myself, I don't, you know, often every professional photographer has probably had the same thing. You want to go out for a walk or something and then suddenly you've got a camera full of camera bag full of cameras and lenses yeah. because you don't know what to take. And yeah. something that's small and light really helps you in that situation. Um, I recently yeah. came back from Japan and I just took three lenses for it and it's fantastic. Really yes, I've got, a, I've got one of your, a couple of your pictures here mm. actually. Oops, Bill, there's a one here, which I really like. Let me just, I'm just looking at uh, Lightroom here. Let me just share that. I think this was shot on the S on the CL. Is that right? Oh, cropping's a bit weird. So I've cropped it. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> there we go. That's better. There we go. Oops, I pressed that's it on. But better. anyway, you can see yeah. it now. So. <laughs> um, that's that's shot on the Summerlux. Yeah, thirty-five yeah, Summerlux. On, so those of you who you probably can't see, you can see me in the little window, but yeah. uh, that's the Summerlux on the, uh, the the CL. When I come back to me, I'll. I'll hold it up again. That's exquisite. Yeah. That picture. That, that that really shows up. Thanks, the lens it's beautiful far, lens. So. Brilliant. When I was in Japan, however, I did tend to use the little zoom, the 18 to the 56 quite so a lot. Because, convenient, isn't it? Well, once it sits on the camera, you just it's so hard to take it off because mm. you can use it for so many things. Yeah, mm. indeed. So a lot of the other pictures from that are on that. That's the summer lux that I was talking about. And then this is the little little zoom. How dinky is, is that? Yeah, I mean, they've yeah. both got lens hoods on, to be fair, but it, it, it's just so convenient. Mm. I mean, it's... What three stops slower than this than the the, the Summilux, but yeah, it, it's but, just so useful and it's incredible. But almost going back to that same situation about the aperture, the question about the aperture yeah, is you know, you're good not going to use that fast aperture for everything. And a lot of the time, yeah. if you're in a landscape situation, you're going to want to have a much bigger aperture anyway. So it doesn't Absolutely. matter. Absolutely. And just lastly, from Jim, then we'll move on to some other questions. Um, uh, please talk reliability and about your confidence in the camera as an everyday workhorse. Do you have a backup camera and how thirsty is the camera on batteries? Okay, well, I'll, I'll answer my, my, I'll give you my perspective first, Tim. Um, reliability, 100%. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to knock on wood, but um, I've had zero issues with anything. I've broken some things, but that's been my fault, uh, not a reliability issue at all. Um, I use these cameras for work all day, every day. The SL2, the SL before that, M240 before that, S series before that, um, and they've always got the job done. So no issues from my side of the table here. Um, I have a back, I have my backup camera is the CL. My SL2 is the main camera. The CL is my backup camera because the lenses are interchangeable within certain uh, limits. Okay, it changes the format slightly. And um, the CL is good enough on batteries. It's by no means the best, it's by no means the worst. It's entirely fine. And I'd say the SL2 is about the same, but I always have two batteries in my pocket. So Mark, how do you get on with the SL from a reliability point of view? Well, like you, we have, um, I have an SL as my personal camera and both of our studios carry SLs as well. So my other photographers are using them. Uh, when I'm on assignment, if I've got an assignment that's primarily led with an SL, I have the SL with a CL as my backup. Mm -hmm. um, my SL has three batteries, are always fully charged, of course. And that gets me through a whole day shooting with these. Um, the CL is there as my backup. It's not really a primary primary camera for me. If I've got a camera that leads with the M, for example, I'll take the C as my backup. Um, it's an excellent backup camera because it still enables me to keep a, a fairly lightweight bag and I can use the adapters to run the M lenses on the CL as well, which is great. Mm, mm. Yeah, that works. that's something else we might talk about later if we get time is that I think if you consider the, the TL mount on its own, which is the same mount as the, the SL2 and the CL, there's if you use the adapters for it, I think there's a somewhere around 150 different lenses you can actually fit onto the cameras which is quite astonishing and if, yeah. then if you include all the r lenses and all the vintage lenses it, it, it is an enormous range of stuff so bill do you have um what do you use to keep yourself safe in the field oh look i, I carry too many cameras all the time um i have <laughs> when you know the cl when the, i'd like to have an sl2 actually and have the cl as the backup i think um, that's going to be what I would like to have very much. Um, but I always have two or three cameras with me. Mm. I just mm. make sure, you know. Fair enough. Actually, speaking about the SL2, has has it turned up yet? Because I, no. I sent one to you yet. Damn. Not turned up. <laughs> you sent one to you yesterday. To to play ring any moment. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully that'll turn up today. You'll play find a courier knocking at the door as we're doing this yeah. webinar. Yeah. All right. So that, um, thanks for those questions, Tim. Um, then Rosalie Nielsen asked a question, which is, she said it's a crystal ball probably required. And I think uh, that's fa fair to say. Um, let me just load. I was wondering what the panel considers the future of street photography, uh, how it will be post pandemic, given that there are likely to be fewer people in streetscapes for quite some time. What's it like in Melbourne and Sydney at the moment out on the streets? Um, I haven't been there for a while, so maybe you can talk to that. Maybe Mark can start with that one. With Melbourne, I live in Geelong, but I also travel to Melbourne quite regularly, but a studio up there. Um, it's funny, sometimes it's hauntingly quiet, which mm. in and of itself to me is a very interesting landscape mm. um, to, to find Melbourne with no people in it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, but of late, it's been quite busy. So not back to the pre-pandemic craziness busy, mm. but, uh, but certainly busy enough. Um, I don't know that it's going to really change a lot. I think there'll always be something, there'll always be a human element to any any cityscape, um, so I don't think it's going to change a great deal after after all this is over. Mm. And Bill, what's going like to come maybe? back? Yeah, it's going to come back to normal. I think slowly. Um, mm. I think people will just want to get out on the street. I mean, obviously, it's going to be a thing that people will be very wary about for a while. But mm. well, I've seen I've seen some quite good stuff like coming out of Sydney um, from a few yeah. people I know. So obviously, there's people out there still shooting. Um, yeah. I, I I just I don't know quite what the rules are around that these days. I think we're relaxing a, a bit, but it's a bit hard to keep up. I don't know how how you guys find that. Well, I'm not shooting people at the moment. No, um, no. That's definitely not what I'm doing. Um, I'm taking a walk near the beach. That's what I'm doing. But uh, yeah, Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough too. Yes. All right. Well, hopefully that gives, gives Rosalie some perspective. But I, I don't think it's, I think it'll just slowly go back to where things were. But as Mark made out, made the point, sometimes you're getting different pictures when there's less people around. You can get those mm -hmm. haunting streetscapes with the, the solitary figure in the distance rather than being surrounded by throngs of people. So, um, yeah, it's hard to say, really. It's um, amazing. Yeah. I'm seeing more pictures like that coming from London and places like that. Yeah, I've got a friend that lives yeah. in Manchester, and he's yeah. got all these amazing photos of the streets of Manchester, absolutely empty, and it's just quite surreal. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen a few floating around on Facebook like that as well. 
Um, question from Wendy Ong. Um, number, question number one of three, only relatively <laughs> short ones. <laughs> What's the difference in output to use the SL 50 mil F2, the, F, the 50 mil Simicron, and the M 50 mil Simicron on the SL2? Apart from the fact, obviously, that there's autofocus on, on the camera. I, I'm, I don't know, Mark, have you... I don't I know Bill hasn't used the SL2 yet. That's happening very shortly, hopefully. Mark, you're you're using the SL. Have you used the 50 mil Summicron SL lens on the SL? And no, the I haven't. 50 mil no. You haven't. Okay. No. Well, I, I might answer that one because I've used both sure. of them. Um, there's not a lot to see between them um, in terms of image quality. Um, we did have um, a, a lecture from Peter Carver the other day uh, in, in part of our internal training, and he made the point that the, the, the current range of Summicron lenses for the SL series are actually measured to a higher standard than M lenses were. It doesn't mean that the M lenses are, are poor quality or anything like that. It's just that the standards they are now testing to and all of their design work and all of their manufacturing and the polishing and the, everything is now stepped up to a level which potentially gives the the new the newer lenses a future proof against higher resolution sensors so he said that the um that the m lenses are absolutely as identical to the semicron lenses for the sl at about up to about 24 megapixels past that they may you may start to see some differences but and i had i've looked i've looked myself and i can't see it um, that when, when Peter Carver says there's a difference, <laughs> he's talking something you can measure with a micrometer or, you know, really, really something really, you know, highly technical. Personally, I've seen very little difference between the two. So the main difference is size. Um, obviously the M Summicron is half the size of the, uh, SL Summicron. Um, but as, in terms of image quality, I think you'd be very, very pushed to see any difference at all. So that's, that's just my experience with those lenses, you know, uh, measuring aside, that's my experience. Question number two, um, which we can all answer. Uh, Wendy has a Q2, an SL2 uh, with the SL 50 mil Simicron on it, and she does street and travel photography. What other lenses would we recommend? That's a difficult one. So Bill, what, what do you, beyond the 50 mil lens, would you go wider or would you go longer? For street? I'll go wider, definitely. Wider, but okay, interesting. I don't like, I mean, you know, I know some people use 28 mil or something like that. I think 35 mil is quite nice for street. It gives you that sort of mm -hmm. halfway mm -hmm. in between. Okay, um, so you'd go yeah, for I, a wider I, lens. All right, fair enough. And Mark, which way would you go? I'd probably go wider as well. Um, I, I, yeah, a 35 is great. I'd, I even go half that again. I'd probably go to 18 too if you're doing sort of any street festivals or musicians. Mm. The 18 is great to get a lot of information to a very small space. This is the 18 on the SL you're talking about. Oh, full frame 18, 18 on, the, on the M, actually. At the M, yeah, which is yeah, this little lens here. Yeah, but you could actually shoot ultra wide on the SL as well and get the same sort of result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. I, I would concur with that because um, I get this question a lot, and I'm sure you guys get this question a lot too in, in classes, you know, which lens to buy. And once you start with that 50 mil lens, you've either got to go to wider angle or more telephoto. I think. The most, the, the most productive step would be to go wider, but it's not necessarily the easiest step because I think it gets harder and harder to shoot well-organized images with wide-angle lenses because you've got so much in the frame. It's a lot easier to control the shot with a telephoto lens, but sometimes the images aren't quite as personal or not quite as intimate. So I think the 18 mil is, is a very wide lens and it's a, a very difficult lens to use in that respect yeah. when there's a lot Indeed. of chaos going on. I mean, I think the shots I've seen of yours, Nick, there tend to be not too many people in, and it's a combination of a person and the space, and it works very yeah. well for that. Yeah, that's fair enough. No, that's a good point, Bill. So, yeah, but I, I think the next lens would be uh, somewhere around, the, for me, 24, 28 mil. Bill reckons a 35, maybe a little close to 50 mil for the investment. 35 uh, is not my particular favorite lens. It's just yeah. that street. I mean, it's not my favorite wide-angle lens particularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. And then the last question for Wendy, then we'll go to the Q&A questions that are coming up on my screen here. Um, would you recommend to use the TL lenses on the SL2? Well, again, you guys haven't used the SL2 yet, so I'll, I'll pick that one up. Um, when you shoot with the TL lenses on the SL2, you end up with a 20 megapixel capture and you end up with the same angle of view as you get on the CL. So the camera automatically crops the image to APS-C size. 
you get just as good autofocus and you get just as good image quality. So shooting with the TL lenses on the SL2 gives you almost identical image quality shoot to shooting on the, the, the CL itself. Um, just a, sm a small drop of actual resolution. But as far as functionality is concerned, it's great. And if you put the Summicron, the Summilux lens on the SL2, you get a lovely 50mm 1.4 um, with the uh, waterproof uh, and weather, weather sealing of the uh, SL2. So uh, I found that they're very, very interchangeable. It's only when you need 47 megapixels that you're actually paying a price and you are, you are dropping back to 20 megapixels. All right, we better move on to these other questions that are coming in. So I'm gonna start from the top of the list, so the first ones that were asked. Um, okay, Quick, uh, Richard Nunn asks, what is the future of Lightroom and its obvious move to send us to online storage and higher costs? Um, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, that's a tricky one. What do you guys think about the subscription model for the Adobe software and then and cloud storage? Have you got any feelings or, or thoughts on that? I'll, I'll weigh in there. I'm not a huge fan of subscription service. I'd rather buy the software and own it. Mm. Uh, I find for me that I don't need to necessarily have the latest and greatest bells and whistles on the software. Mm. Um, so I would rather own the software and, and run it for a few years and then upgrade only when the feature set becomes um, mm. irresistible or useful to me. Mm. I find it really, really difficult when they just change things every five minutes in subscription. Mm. Um, mm. They move things around and stuff like that. It drives me crazy, but I do have subscription, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't that actually use really Lightroom. Really use Camera Raw. <laughs> that yeah. was the thing. Yeah. I remember I used to have the, uh, the master suite, you know, the Adobe master suite. And um, I used to get a reasonable, a bit of assistance from Adobe. I, in the interest of full, uh, full disclosure, I didn't pay full price for it. But I think the retail price of that package was somewhere around 4,000 bucks. Um, now for your $70, $80 a month, you get the same application. So it's a good deal. But I don't disagree with you guys at all. Uh, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. Personally, I just pay my money, and uh, but I see the difference is I don't know whether Bill. I know you won't be using InDesign and Illustrator and things like that. You'll be Photoshop, Lightroom. Uh, Mark's probably the same. But if you need to go a little bit broader, the full subscription is really good value. But yeah, but you know the online storage thing I think is more pertinent because I do not believe in the online storage of, of images. I refuse to use it. I don't find it yeah. useful, and I don't want to use it. What about you guys? I don't want to use it. No. No, no, it's just a no. No, no. <laughs> Straight forward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Simple answer. Yeah. Uh, why, do you control? why? Why would you? Why do you say that so unequivocally? No. I want to be in control of my images. Mm. Uh, if something goes wrong, I want to know that it was me that that, that did or did not have the other steps in place to mitigate that. Yeah. Um, so we everything we do is is backed up. We do have some cloud backup that we do as well, but that's very much a third or a fourth option if all else fails if armageddon takes place um so now everything we do is is actually stored on on uh on our server yeah and then we have uh we actually archive the finished images to m disk which is the millennium disks uh, which are apparently a thousand year lifespan um we i like to be in control of the images yeah mm -hmm. bill yeah, I'm, I'm really not wanting to trust. I, I guess I'm not trusting. Um, I just don't want something to go, something go wrong and you can't grab something. I know it doesn't happen very often. I've not heard of too many instances, but I, yeah, I like, uh, physically want it to be there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give two examples of this. Firstly, um, sitting on a plane in the olden days, <laughs> uh, bored, I was working out how long it would take to upload all of my images to a cloud storage. Not the cost, just the time, because I have a very poor internet connection, uh, which has been apparent sometimes in these webinars. It's not, you know, it's a bit choppy sometimes. And I, I worked out it would take approximately 700 days to upload all my images. So that's not very practical. But the yeah. second thing is there have been situations where um, online storage companies have gone bust and one minute, you just simply can't log in and there is no way of getting those images back. You just go to the end of the creditor list like everybody else. And that yeah. scares me. So I'm with these guys. I absolutely want to have control of my images and I have an array of hard drives. And when we do a Lightroom course or discussion, we can talk more about that because it's a real can of worms, which I don't propose to open right at this very minute. Um, let me see. Next question. Um, Mirek has asked about strobes and flashes. Now, um, and portable lights for environmental portraits. Now, Mark, I know you use uh, either available light outside, but in the studio, you're fully you're fully strobe equipped, aren't you? That's right. Yeah. We used Ellen Chrome for many many years, so mm -hmm. yeah, probably thirty five years. Um, 
recently we've gone across to pro photo because we have the yeah. battery the battery heads available and they're, they're working really oh, yeah. really well yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but no, i use strobe um, successfully with both the m and the sl cameras mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah. All right. what about outdoors for environmental portraits do you take them on location or do you tend to shoot available light I tend to not tend to not do that. I tend to shoot available light and use reflectors or screamers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, Bill. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to use video. daylight. I definitely like to use daylight first um, right. and scrim and all that sort of stuff. That's mm -hmm. definitely desired, but mm -hmm. um, can't always do it. So I do take I do take lights with me. Um, it just depends on the job. But yeah, yeah I'll, I'll use battery lights now. I mean, I do have some bronze color stuff that's studio stuff. Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm personally I'm torn because on one hand there's the flexibility not, actually it's not that flexible available light is it because it is what it is and you've got to you've got to work with it but i love the idea of being able to add my own lights but the reality is um i very rarely have time um i'm doing my documentary work which i've been showing over the last couple of webinars is really has as it happens and you really don't get a chance to actually polish that picture in the shooting stage so it's a tricky one so to answer Mirak, uh, most of us will probably shoot mostly available light where the situation demands it but when we have time and the uh, it's appropriate like in the studio absolutely we'll be using strobes well there are jobs that i have to do nick where i have to go on location and i have to run from one place to another and no. so i'll have flash on camera that i can take off camera um, okay. as well and that's a much quicker that's much quicker yeah, but it's, that again, it, it depends on what's required, really. Mm, mm. It's tricky to use, though, because you've got to balance it with available, and that's a really difficult skill yeah. to learn, I think. A lot of people stumble over that, I find. Yeah, it takes a while to set up, yeah, mm. and it does mm. take a while to get used to it. All right. Um, next one was oh, Richard Nunn has asked about the working with the TL 35mm Semilux on the SL and STL 2 I've already answered that one. It works beautifully. So it's absolutely fine. In fact, it's a very... In fact, one thing I should say, it's a very economic way of getting the Leica Summilux look because if you compare the price of this lens to the M lens of the equivalent specification, you'll find that it's uh, considerably less and it's the, it's the yeah. real deal. It's not a, a cut price version. It's, it's the real deal. It's one of the sharpest lenses I've ever used. So beautiful. Okay. Um, Ken Wang. I love the Noctilux dreamy look but I find my hit rate is so low for sharpness. Even when it's in focus, I still need to sharpen in Lightroom. Any advice, please? Mark, you're the Noctilux man, and I'll put a picture up whilst you're doing that, whilst you're starting that question. Well, the Noctilux, when I, I got it from Leica maybe six or seven years ago, um, it made me feel like I was a, a complete amateur. Uh, every second image was was right out, uh, out of focus, and, um, and it's just so rewarding when you nail it. Uh, the depth of field must be only a few millimetres deep. I mean, it's, um, and I'm always aiming for the surface of the eye, of course. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so, right it's, I, I, you know, obviously, you can do a bit of post-production uh, sharpening if you want to, but I, I found that when you nail that catch light in the eyes, it's probably enough for me. Um, I haven't had to really do much more after the fact. Um, and there's another one uh, next to it too. Yeah. So there's another image that's... Um, that's shot wide open with daylight as well with the screen. Yeah, so you can um, see the fall off here very, very clearly. It's got a lovely milky, creamy sort of buttery background. It's just, just mm. you know, that's what I love about that lens. But yes, look, I agree. It's um, it's a really, you can breathe the wrong way when you're making exposure and lose the focus. That's how yeah. diabolical it is. It's unforgiving, but, isn't it? It is, yeah. But it, it's worth persevering with. I'll, I'll just, um, one little bit of, one little gadget. Let me just come back to the, my full screen. I don't know if you can see this little fellow here. This is the, uh, can everyone see that? I don't have a close up camera. This is the Visorflex for the M. Um, this makes your hit rate a lot higher because you can see exactly where the focus point is. Either that or use the Noctilux on the SL2 because when you focus it, you can click the button on the back of the camera and it magnifies to 100%. And you get you can see critically where you're focused. The M camera is accurate with its focusing, but it's quite hard to judge. It's quite hard to see whether you hit the focus or not. Whereas you put an electronic viewfinder on the top of the M10, uh, or you use the SL, or even the the the, the, T, uh, the CL, and you'll find that you've got those focusing aids, which makes a big difference. It really does. Okay, next question. Um, Oh, America has another, another comment. One man, one man shot or full crew Annie Leibovitz style? Are we Annie Leibovitz crews or are we one man bands? 
Uh, I've worked with both. I've worked with crew and assistants and so forth. Um, I tend to like working one-on-one as much as I possibly can. Um, the steamroll shop that you showed just a, a while before with that Russian, the Russian model, the Nocti, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that was with a full crew. I think you've even got a, that's, that's when I say full crew, we had a lot of people on that Lycra Academy trip. So I had a lot of people mm-hmm. holding reflectors and so forth. I might have a picture of that. Have I got a, pi- uh, I yeah, got a picture of that I somewhere. had one. Yeah, I might not yeah. have pulled it in for this. That's yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but look, it's great to have a lot of crew, particularly if you're, if you're wielding, you know, three metre by three metre screens and so forth on a beach with wind. You need to have an assistant for those sorts of things. But ideally, I'd rather lose a little bit of flexibility with lighting mm. and, and just have the intimacy with which a one on one portrait session, you know, gives me. Yeah. Then, Bill, how do you, do you work one man band or with a crew? It, it depends on the job. I mean, sometimes, you know, you've had a couple of assistants or something like that or one assistant. It, mm. It's good having an assistant because you kind of feel like as long as you know the person, you feel reassured, um, you know, even if it's you're going to walk off somewhere and you're going to leave something and someone's going to pick it up for you, as simple as that, it makes life mm. very easy. Um, but if it gets to be too big a thing, there's too many people involved, like, you know, a studio shoot I did not too long ago, and there's mm. people looking over a monitor, it's tethered, mm. um, and it's such a big production, it mm. just becomes something else. But, I mean, that's probably what's required for that kind of job. But I do prefer to shoot in a small situation, one-to-one. It's always I think nice. You sort of, I think you sort of nailed it there. It's what's required for the job. Yeah, so if sometimes you need hair, makeup, wardrobe, mm. lighting assistance, and sometimes you need to be focused on the shooting and not having to scurry around uh, moving lights when you can actually just direct people. Um, I remember when uh, I was working in Sydney when I first met Bill, we, we used to share each other's assisting abilities. There was a few of us, and we used to like assist each other in different jobs. And one of the, the big benefits of that in, in the Sydney summer was that it's not that great for the photographer to be all hot and sweaty when you turn up at a job. So you can have an assistant who lugs all the gear and gets hot and sweaty, and you can breeze in looking all cool, calm, and sophisticated. And I found that worked well because I'm, I'm unfortunately a little bit on the I perspire a bit when I get hot and it's very embarrassing when you're rocking up to do some corporate portraits and you're all sort of wringing wet. So uh, there's benefits there. All right. Um, Andrea Coffey, um, this is to do with using lenses wide open. She says, is it more a case of don't hesitate to use the, wi- the, the lens wide open? I'll, I'll start off by saying if you're using a Leica lens, yes, do not hesitate to use the lens wide open. You will not, you're not compromising your quality. This is not the case with some lenses uh, and generally speaking you your, your price point will determine how good that lens is wide open this is what you pay for uh, mark would you agree with that absolutely i think i i think i'd use a wider apertures for the majority of my one-on-one portraits mm-hmm. um if i've got information in the image let's say i'm, I'm doing an environmental portrait portrait of a, an executive in his, in his office or someone in a factory where I want the background information to carry over, uh, under those circumstances, I would actually uh, stop down a little bit just to get some more information. But mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. surprising when you're shooting at those wider apertures, what you can have in the background that's identifiable, even though it's not tack sharp. Mm-hmm. And then that, that way the emphasis is still on the subject and not on the background. I'm going to bring up a picture here of yours, which I haven't seen before until today. Uh, this shows up the separation of the background from the subject. Yes, yeah. Well, that one there is shot in a little tiny church, a little village in Uganda. Uh, it's Father Nestus, and that's with a um, a fairly old 50 mil 1.4, actually, a Sumlux. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, but just it, it, it shows that, he, it, I mean, you've got his collar that's on, um, and you see the shape of the building in the background. It's very evident who he is, what he does, and where he's been photographed. Yeah. Um, that background doesn't need to be sharp for us to know what it is. Right. Yeah, exactly. You, you, the shape tells you what you need to know. You don't need the detail, otherwise you lose the separation. And I think, so Andrew, I think um, it, it's fair to say, yeah, shoot, shoot wide open when you want to separate, but if you need everything sharp, then obviously don't hesitate to stop down and shoot at F11 or something like that. Chris Waters has what is described as a very general question. I'd like to ask what cameras and lenses the two guests tend to use for their preferred assignments and perhaps other equipment they might use. That's a very general question. So I'll, I'm going to sort of narrow that down a bit. When you go out on a, uh, a reasonable, uh, sort of modest sized job, what's the, what will be the, 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 the two or three absolutely essential things that you would take with you, camera and lens wise? Um, I'll answer first. Perhaps I'll, I'd go the SL and the 24 to 90. I think mm-hmm. that's a really great 
combo. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm shooting the M, I'll take a 35, a 50, and a 90 mil. Okay, okay. That, that's pretty good. I always have a combination between primes and zoom lenses. Um, mm -hmm. Some things, zoom lenses, just you have to have a zoom for some things, especially if you're working quickly. Um, and there's a reason that the sort of a 24 to 90 is such a great range, it covers so much stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like a prime lens is going to do something that's going to give you a different look. So you need mm. to have both of those things in your camera bag. Mm. Mm. But, um, you know, it's, it's definitely horses for courses. The zoom yeah, gets you out of point. so many yeah. situations. Yeah, yeah. I think um, the, in fact, I'll be look, be interested to hear what you think about the 24 to 90 when you, when you get it on the SL2. Because I have uh, used the 24 to 90 quite a bit. On yeah. the SL, I know you have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but as a, you've got this sort of choice between sort of, emphasizing function and then emphasizing the look and you'll, mm. you'll find that the, the, you know, the, the Summilux lenses, the Summicron SL lenses, they have that distinct look to them, but obviously they're not as versatile because they're a fixed focal length. Whereas you go yeah. to the 24 to 90 or the, the little, um, little zoom on the CL and you've got the versatility, but it doesn't have that look and you have to make that decision. And, and as Bill says, you know, if you can take both, then you can, at least, you can dip into your bag and, and use what's appropriate. My first choice will almost always be the 24 to 90 on the SL um, because there's virtually nothing you can't do with that lens in, you know, most in, in, in all circumstances. Right. You know, obviously I can't do wildlife or, or something like that, but there's 90% of what I need to shoot can probably be done on that lens. All right. Um, let's go back to Andrew. has got another question, Andrew Coffey. When using a monochrome, what are, oh, here we go. What are your favorite filters? Red, green, blue, circular polarizer. Mark, you've used the monochrome a lot. Do you use color filters on the lens? Yeah, I, I should say that I don't have the monochrome any longer. Um, I do want yeah. to delve into an M10 monochrome when I, when I can afford it or, mm -hmm. or just hire it. Um, but I did use, for, for people photography, an orange filter, which mm -hmm. tends to really lighten skin tones and gives yeah, a really lovely view. Well, yeah. um, yeah. yeah. And shooting landscapes, a red filter is fantastic as well. I've, I've, I've photographed some bands uh, on location using, uh, using a red filter. Mm -hmm. You get a, a, a blue sky goes really, really quite dark and, you, and your clouds are something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. well, Bill, you said you, you, earlier that you shot a lot of black and white film back in the day. Yeah. Well, yeah. Would you use colour filters on those? Yeah, absolutely. I love the red filter. I mean, yeah, red yeah. filter's great. But you can't shoot um, a portrait with red lipstick on a red filter because no, it kind of you disappears and yeah, goes white. Yeah. So you have to use green yeah. lipstick or something like that. But yeah, um, you like shooting a portrait with a blue filter and you get like black lips, don't you? Yeah. It's horrible. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, you used to use filters a lot in black and white film. Um, mm. But you know, red and orange were, were very useful and obviously sort of green and yellow for foliage and stuff yep. like that. If you, Andrew, if you want to find out more about filters, um, go to our YouTube channel and you'll find three, was it four, three or four specific videos that uh, I did for uh, Leica HQ a couple of years ago, which go through what the color filters are for and how they work and uh, what the differences are in the final results. So check those out and I think that'll answer your question as well. Um, Robert Ryan, um, what, oh, so to Bill, what was the third the third lens that Bill took? Now I'm, that was asked a while ago, so I've lost sort of yeah, sync no, between was, questions and talk. Do you know what it means? Yeah, it was it well the fifty five to one three five when I went to Japan? I think it was twelve right. three lenses. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a so, um, the, the, the fifty five. It's this this little thing here. It's not very big. Fifty five to one three five. It's a cracking lens. It's equivalent yeah. to about an eighty to two hundred. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, okay, it's not very fast. Four five is at the long end, but mm. um, three five at the short end. But it's just so compact and it mm. is so sharp. I just mm. absolutely love this lens. It's yeah, I was amazed when I first used it. It is how yeah. sharp it was. You know, I was. I've seen a lot of stuff that you've used. You've done a lot of stuff with that, and it's yeah, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a great lens. Really good. Yeah, excellent. Okay, um, and when Bill, do you use any filter with the Leica? So, are you using any filters on the CL at the moment, Bill? No. No, no. no. You, okay, just to expand on that just for a couple of minutes, do you guys put filters on your lenses by, by habit or do you not have any filters at all by habit? You know, some people put UV filters on the front. Do you guys do that? I used to. Um, I don't anymore. Um, I found that when I have hoods on the front of my lenses and they go nose down to my camera bag, I, I don't have the need for, uh, for protecting the front element. Yeah. 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 I do tend to have filters on some of my lenses because, you know, like if you've got a small hood, like a, you know, like a, that 55, for mm. instance, the, the, um, 
the um, 18 to 56 or whatever it is, yeah, that's, this fellow. that's yeah. a small hood. Um, yeah. If you were walking through the bush or something, someone flicked a branch into your lens, um, you wouldn't want that. So yeah. it's more a protection thing more than anything. Yeah. I have had situations where I wished yep. I had had a filter on the front when I have actually damaged the front of the, the lens. But uh, we'll just say I did have a terrible situation once. I was photographing on Avalon Beach with a Hasselblad years ago, and this wind came up out of nowhere, and this savage wind just went right on the front of the lens and mm. streaked all these marks across the lens. And I think it was four hundred dollars to get that lens sorted Ooh. out. So you know, it was Ooh. kind of like I went. Well, I didn't have a filter on because I guess there's always this thing about if you're buying good quality glass, you've mm. got to have a filter that's just as good. Otherwise, yeah. why would you buy the lens? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You know. Next question in the list, which I don't know whether we're going to get time to, to talk about because it's a bit, it's a little bit broad. Um, anonymous attendee. <laughs> Hello, anonymous attendee. Um, what <laughs> makes a good picture good? Oh. That's a tricky one. Okay, I'm going to ask you quickly, guys. Can you give me like a sentence about what it is that you look for in a picture that makes that that lifts it above the ordinary? Just one thing. Tough question. For me, it's something that something that moves me initially, mm -hmm. um, and then if I'm able to move the person I made the photograph for, um, I can get paid for it. So, uh, <laughs> if it's something that moves me initially, if it feeds my creative side, mm -hmm. that's probably the first tick box. Mm -hmm. And then um, if, it, if it can then move the person I've made it for, that'd be um, an important thing too. Okay, good, good, good answer. Bill? Might sound a bit sort of glib, but if, if you capture the essence of what you're trying to photograph, there's, there's mm -hmm. something where you just feel like there was something there at the time and you just capture it and you know that you've got that. Um, it's hard to explain really, but yeah, it is, uh, it I mean, it, it's mood and emotion really. Yeah, mood and emotion. Mood and emotion. Was mm -hmm. it, it Ansel Adams said? There's nothing worse than a sharp picture of a fuzzy concept. So you know you can get bogged down yeah. in the technical stuff, but yeah. it's still got to have some some life to it, some some emotion to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thomas Schlatter wants to know whether there'll be a new CL shortly. Can't answer that. <laughs> Not allowed to. Even, like, even if I said I don't know, you you probably wouldn't believe me. But no, we, we unfortunately we're not allowed to talk about products that may or may not be in the pipeline. So um, the uh, yeah, <laughs> Alfonso. Uh, any suggestions on how to use the M camera when doing street photography? I find it slow as it doesn't have autofocus. So Mark, what's the secret to working with a rangefinder camera? The secret is not really a secret. Um, <laughs> high focal distance is your friend. Um, I know a lot of the work that I do, not that I'm a, a street photographer as such, but when I travel and I've got time between what I'm photographing officially, uh, mm -hmm. I do have an M with me. And um, it's great to have a 35mm lens at F8 and you're walking on the street with it pre-focused using your hyperfocal distance. That's it. Yeah. You just pick it up and shoot. Mm -hmm. And many times when I've had a suspicious subject looking at me, I've been able to hold the camera in such a way where I'm pretending like I'm photographing something else. Yeah, yeah. And I can just quickly click yeah. at the image and go back. So uh, I've been able to surreptitiously make some great street images without people knowing that I'm photographing. Yeah. yeah. Bill, how do you go with that? Bill, are you there? Yep. Bill's frozen. <laughs> uh oh. I think we've lost Bill. I can see a picture, but I can't see uh, hear any sound. Uh oh. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll, I'll have to concur with, um, with, with Mark. Um, the secret of M photography, range photo photography, is not to focus, not to focus on as things happen. You should have already focused on what's probably going to happen. It's anticipation. And if you watch some of the really good guys doing street photography, you'll find that they've actually set a focal distance and they're working to maintain that distance to the subject. Um, I've been out with Alan Schaller, I've been out with Craig Sumetko, and they will set it to two or three meters looking for backgrounds. And when people come, they'll be, they, they won't even necessarily frame it. So if you're trying to follow the focus and focus reactively in an M system, you, you really will have a great deal of difficulty. That's where autofocus sometimes helps. Okay. Um, next question, uh, Keith Allardyce. Um, I understand that Nick uses QNAP NAS systems, so hard drive arrays. Bill and Mark, what do you prefer to use for your storage for your images? I'll start um, with Bill actually. Pick, um, go, go, if, if, is Bill there? No. Bill's no, back in. Got Bill. I think my assistant here is on the phone to Bill. So we'll see. So, Mark, maybe you can just pick up this one. 
what we do is we obviously photograph on memory cards. Um, I'm never feeling very safe about memory cards until they're actually mm -hmm. been transferred to a server. Um, our server actually then backs up to a separate backup server. Um, and then we have a plug-in drive that backs up as well. So we have multiple ways of, multiple, multiple copies of the data really. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, we're we not using, um, we're using a, a NAS array in one of our servers, but um, but yeah, we, we like to make sure we've got as many redundancies in place as we can manage. So I, I am listening. I'm just hearing about what's going on with this bill on the phone. What's he can try and join again and we should, I should see him as a panelist. Um, yeah, just try and log in again. Sorry about that guys. So yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, you, Mark's got a, a very, very sophisticated backup system. I think it's many tens, possibly more than that, thousands of dollars. Um, the question refers to the QNAP masses, which I use, and I've got a, um, a couple of four bay units, which I use, they're 28 terabytes each, and they, they get alternated. So I back up to one, and then I store one, and then I swap them around and back up to that. Um, I've found that they've been more than... Uh, adequately reliable to the point where I've never had a problem with them. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're an excellent device. But I'll just, I'll just make one point before we move on. Always have more storage space than you think you could possibly need, <laughs> yep. because you will fill it up. The margin, what was it? The uh, capacity to expand into all possible spaces is limitless in photography. Yeah. Um, Andrea says she recommends uh, a NAS system. Oh, I, she says, I highly recommend a NAS, a network attached storage device. So it, broadly speaking, she's, she recommends a, a NAS device. Um, and she says QNAP or Synology, I think they're very equivalent. In my experience, the QNAP ones are a little more robust. Um, they're also more expensive. I mean, QNAPs are not a cut price product by any stretch of the imagination. I have used both. Uh, I've never had a problem with either, let's I'll be clear, but the Synology ones seem to be just a little bit less uh, well-built. So if that makes any difference, I mean, really it's about the hard drives inside. Um, I'm using Seagate uh, Iron Wolf Pros myself, um, and they seem to be, to be fine. Okay, um, Bill's still trying to get back on. How's he going? Is Oh, here he goes. Let me. So he's. I can see him here, and make him co-host again. Okay, should be able to turn his audio on. Oh, I love it when technology doesn't work. Here we go. Here he is. Hey, here he is. <laughs> Welcome back. Just disappeared completely. Hey. Yep. Hey, it's. it's we're all flexible around here. Not a problem at yeah. all. Well done. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, Yusuf wants to know, he says, hello, I currently own an MP240. Would you buy a Q2 as a second camera or a CL as a more practical, fast shooting camera? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, but I'll start, with, I'll start with, uh, with Mark whilst Bill settles back into his seat. What, what would you say to Yusuf? Well, I had an MP240 and I love it. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome camera. Um, I, I, I love the Q, absolutely. The Q and the Q2, love them both. I, I feel that for me, I'd rather the flexibility of being able to use the, um, the CL mm -hmm. and put my M lenses on it. So it becomes, in effect, an alternate um, camera system, but it also mm -hmm. becomes a backup camera system for my M, which can use my M lenses on as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on what you're shooting, doesn't it, really? Um, of course it does, uh, yeah. Because obviously yeah. you've got that fixed lens on the on the on the Q. Yeah. But the CL That's gives you all the choices. So. Yeah, it's a second camera. I've I've often had that question, CL or Q, and this was the Q. But now we've got the Q2, it does shift that discussion a little bit because obviously they're not equivalent anymore because the, the CL yeah. is 24 megapixels, the Q is 24 megapixels. One's got a fixed 28, one's got interchangeable lenses. So they are different, you know, different, but they, they overlap in their function. Whereas the Q2 now at 47 megapixels, if you're going for that high resolution, it's either that or the SL2. But if, it's, if the resolution is not... Uh, a big deal for you and 47 is a lot more than a lot of people need then I would say the Q2 would be a good option as a second camera but it depends on whether you want to take interchangeable lenses it's really a tricky question to answer that one it really is so um, I think uh, I, I got to say though and I know Bill agrees with me on this one that the CL with the with the little 18 to 56 is almost unbeatable as a 
good at most things camera. It's not the best at any one thing, but yeah. it's small, it's reasonably priced, and the image quality is superb. So it scores very highly on all fronts. Maybe not quite as highly on some things, but it's it's you know it's it's a bit of a jack of all trades camera is what I'm trying to say. Got fantastic really balance. Is, is that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I've I've had so many people go out and buy the CL based on me saying go and buy a CL, and come back and say you know what that was the best thing I ever did. So highly recommended. Mm -hmm. Ludwig wants to know. Uh, I used the shift lens quite a bit back in film days, but with manipulation in this age, are shift lenses obsolete? Okay, Bill, do you want to pick that one up? Okay, I've got a friend that's an architectural photographer um, mm -hmm. and he still uses shift lenses, which is, mm -hmm. I found quite interesting because there's so much you can actually do now in, mm -hmm. you know, in Lightroom Photoshop, you know, adjusting the perspective. Um, yeah, yeah. I should ask him why. That's interesting because I, I, I never would think to have one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a tricky one. Too. It's a tricky question. Mark, have you got have a, have you a perspective on that? I don't really shoot a lot of architecture, and nor do I collect any converging um, converging lines when I'm when I'm shooting buildings and so yeah. forth. So it's probably not something that that I really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my my take on that would be that as long as you're not correcting your verticals more than I don't know, ten percent, fifteen percent in post, I think you're better off staying in post. But if you need the absolute end, you know, the the, the bee's knees in quality, and you are doing something that requires correct verticals, then the, the tilt shift lens is always going to be the best way of working. But it's only at the extremes, you know, for general purpose photography, I don't think it's necessary. So uh, I wouldn't, yeah, I, unless you absolutely need one, I would tend to do it in post myself. Uh, Ken Wang, would you use a monochrome viewfinder in the SL for focus peaking using M lenses? I'm not quite sure what you mean by a monochrome viewfinder. If you mean put the camera into monochrome mode so that you can see a monochrome image in the viewfinder, then uh, yes, I would do that. Because if you shoot RAW plus JPEG or just RAW, you will see through the viewfinder when you put the camera into monochrome mode, you'll see a monochrome image, but you will still get a color DNG file, okay? And a black and white JPEG if you shoot both formats. But I've found that putting the camera into, into monochrome mode and using the EVF, allows me to preview what that monochrome result will be like, particularly if you've got color filters on. Do you guys uh, put the camera into black and white mode if you are shooting black and white? That's almost exclusively how I use my SL and my there M. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and Mark, but Bill, you said you don't shoot much black and white anyway. No, I, I don't, but um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll definitely shoot a JPEG, mm -hmm. um, as, as just to see a JPEG, and I'll, but I'll keep the raw in, for color as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and okay. correct afterwards. All right, Stephen Lee, uh, with the rolling out of the new sensor for the M and the SL, um, has anyone experienced shooting with the older Leica lenses? I have a few older M lenses, including the 75mm Semilux. Ooh, classic, uh, very collectible, that lens. And the, idea of a, and the idea of a low hit rate is an important factor for my next purchase. I shoot documentary and street. Any advice is welcome. Um, Mark, you, you, you've got a, a, quite a wide range of collectible cameras and lenses. Do you, do, you, do you find the older lenses work okay? Well, I'm quite lustful for that 75mm Lux, let me tell yeah. you. Um, I, look, I've got a lot of old Leica glass, but sadly I don't get the time to really, I wish I had the time to do it, but mm. I'd love yeah. to go out and start shooting some assignments on some older glass. I just sadly mm. don't get a mm. chance. I would love to. I would just love the idea of collecting a whole bunch of lenses because I used to do that on film all the time. I would, you know, just go for a look, really, I think. Just getting something here. I've got a, um, a lens I do like here, which is, uh, I'll just mention, this is a, this is a 90 mil Elmerit. Uh, so it's a 90 mil F2.8 R series lens um, yeah. with two adapters, one for the R to the M and one for the M to the TL. But this makes a sweet little portrait lens. Um, mm -hmm. beaut one of the things about the vintage lenses, um, which I'll, I'll just make this one point before we move on, is that the focusing being fully mechanical is, is and, and the same with the current range of M lenses, is, is absolutely yeah. beautiful. You feel very connected to your focus point. Um, the other focus lenses, tend, you tend not to feel quite so connected to the focus because it's an electronic system. Um, yeah, this so is why a lot of videographers why. use these mechanical lenses because they want to pull focus. Sharpness wise, this isn't quite as sharp wide open 
as uh, a current lens, but this is a 1965 lens. It's almost as old as me. And at, at, at f4, it's, it's sharp enough uh, on 24 megapixels to be completely usable. I've not tried it on the SL2. But the thing about the old lenses is there's a look to them. Like that 75 mil Similux you're talking about was, was notorious for not being the sharpest lens ever made by Leica. But a lot of people love it for the, the look. The, the actual softness of the lens really adds something to the, to the image itself. It's not all about sharp. It's about look and mood and feel. So um, I'm finding that the older lenses on the new cameras work beautifully because you've got the electronic viewfinder. It actually makes them a lot easier to use. So highly recommended doing that. Um, Benjamin, uh, well, I've got a question from Mirak again. What, uh, not quite sure I follow the question. What I mean, this high level of investment and preparation with props and lights, et cetera. Mirak, do you want to just um, ask another just expand on that question and I'll come back to it. I'm not quite sure what you're referring to with that one. Benjamin, um, how do you make, oh, here we go. How do you make your subjects relax? How's there's, there's a good one. So Bill, start with you. Gosh, I, I mean, so it depends on who they are. Um, you know, I think when you've got someone in front of you, mm. you really have to just sort of, you have to just get them to disengage their brain like that, you know, especially if it's an amateur, like, you know, we're yeah. talking about sometimes I do corporate portraiture and stuff like that. And you've got someone that's not used to being photographed and, you know, you've just got to stop them thinking this is as bad as being at the dentist, which is what a lot of people actually think about photography. Mm, they do. So I usually just sort of try to sort of gently sort of compliment them or talk to them about something. I try to engage with conversation first. Mm. The more you can talk to them, the better. Obviously, there's time constraints sometimes. Yeah. But yeah. just, you know, like just, just try and make them feel comfortable and just try and get close to them as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. If Mark, time permits. Oh, sorry, Bill, I haven't finished. Yeah. yeah Mark, okay. what, do you, uh, yeah. what do you think about that? I tend to use a bit of humour. I think the moment I can be a bit self-effacing, uh, I'm not a particularly yeah. tall person, uh, so yeah. I often judge about my height, and oftentimes I have to stand on an apple box or a ladder or something to get the angle I need for a, a portrait yeah. session. I tend to um, make them feel comfortable that I'm not the most important person in the room that they are, and um, I just take all the pressure off. And so oftentimes we'll sit down and have a chat for maybe... 15, 20 minutes before I even take a, a picture. Yeah. Um, it's just so they get, to, uh, everything that Bill said is, is true as well. But just, yeah. as I said, I, just, I probably just add a little bit of extra humour in the front there just to get them laughing because if they're laughing, they're not thinking as much about being yeah. photographed. Yeah, yeah the humour is part of it. It definitely comes into it. Um, sometimes it's not that easy to do from the beginning, but in the middle of the session, then you can really get into that. I mean, I, I just sort of don't really care about how they see me. It's not about, like I think Mark sort of said the same thing, really. It's mm. like if, I, if I'm doing something stupid or it, it would almost be advantageous because it's disarming to them, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. disarming. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. It's a, it's a tricky thing. And some people are really, really good at putting their subjects at ease and some people are not. And mm. those are the ones that become studio photographers, or, you know, I mean, commercial product photographers, not studio photographers, mm -hmm. um, or I don't know. But the people who've got a real knack of, of getting somebody to relax and, and open up in conversation, they're the ones that do the best portraits because it is a, it's not a photographic skill. It's an interpersonal skill. I mean, the photographic side of things comes next. If you can't get someone to engage and relax, and you, no matter what gear you've got and how good you are at focusing, you're never going to get a good portrait of them, I think. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. And Noan again. Bill, do you use the CL more than your other cameras? Um, not at the moment because I, I don't have a full range of lenses. I've used all of the lenses except for the 23mm. I mm. love it, but... Mm -hmm. I don't have the full range at the moment, so I, I am looking forward to using it more. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I would like a summer lux. That would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. I, it's my favourite lens. That one. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful lens. Ludwig again would like to know: Has portraiture changed from the more mood-based light shades of older black and white to the more evenly lit tonal portraits? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, that's a, a, a searching question. Um, I, I agree with that. I think I, think I, yeah. I could say something about that. Okay. Um, okay. You see more and more that I think dynamic range is an issue here. People talk mm. about dynamic, dynamic range and what a camera can do, how you can pull out the shadows. Um, and I think what he's probably talking about is that a lot of people do that, where yeah. 
they can flatten off an image. So the contrast is reduced um, and you can see lots of detail, but there's something about the mood of a photograph with someone coming out of darkness yeah. with lots of black in a photograph, All which right. I think is quite powerful. And I really can like I show one of your like pictures that. here, Bill. Okay. Black on black. This is one of your pictures of, uh, of Bono. I think this, this makes the point. It's all black on black, isn't it? it that, that makes the image. Yeah. Can you see that one? That's the right one, isn't it? Yeah. I love this picture. Yeah, I think so. The, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a live music shot. Um, the yeah. lighting is what you get. But in a studio situation, I really love people coming out of the darkness. It's something mm. That, mm. that I still think is quite interesting. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. It's, it, think, think about painting, you know. That's, mm. If you go back to the old, the old masters, is it, I can never pronounce this that. word. Maybe you can correct me, but is it? Chiaroscuro. <laughs> Chiaroscuro. <laughs> How do you say it? I'm, I may not be pronouncing it correctly either, but it's, it is exactly the right word to describe <laughs> what you're talking about. Look it up. I can never pronounce it. Chiaroscuro. I, yeah. I'm showing my ignorance here. It's terrible. But yeah, that's sh shade and light. The more Shadows show the shape. It's not the light bits that show the shape. It's the shadows that make the shape. So I think I'd say don't shadows. be afraid of the dark. Mm, mm, yeah. Good quote. Don't be afraid yeah. of the dark. Yeah. Heather. Hi, Heather. And Bill, Heather says, hi, Bill. What are your considerations approach when on film sets? Um, do you use the CL on film sets? Yeah. A mirrorless camera is fantastic on film sets. It's so quiet. Mm -hmm. um, I've used lots of cameras on film sets. And the worst thing is if you're working close and, you know, obviously there's two, two types of shoots when you're on a film set. One is when you're shooting what's happening while the action is rolling, and then mm -hmm. there's a setup shot, which is very mm -hmm. different because mm -hmm. you've got the actors there. But if you're actually um, shooting over someone's shoulder and the camera's making a hell of a lot of noise, you're gonna get some yeah. pretty filthy looks. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Mirrorless cameras are fantastic for that. And Heather, I'll just point out that if you put the SL or the CL or probably other mirrorless cameras onto electronic shutter, they make zero noise. So, um, because there's no mechanical shutter going up and down. These are very right, quiet anyway. It's disconcerting when you're doing that for the first time. You're, you're not sure if you're taking it's a weird, photograph. because you oh, press the yeah. button and nothing happens. It's, it's yeah. bizarre. It's like on the SL2, when you shoot at 20 frames a second, it always uses electronic shutter. And you press your finger down and, and nothing seems to be happening, except you yeah. see the counter scrolling past like crazy. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, last question, because we are at one hour and 12 minutes. So I'm going to uh, take this last question from Juan Woodworth. Um, how would you rate the Leica lenses versus the certified Panasonic lenses uh, for the CL? Um, personally, I've got no experience of the Panasonic lenses on the CL because there's this, just to put this in context, there's a, there's a, um, a group that works with the TL mount, um, the, an alliance that says Sigma, uh, I'm right on it, Sigma, Panasonic, and, um, and Leica, obviously, and they all make different lenses. Now, I've not used those Panasonic lenses myself. Um, have you guys used any of those Panasonic lenses at all? I don't no, but I know some people that are using the Panasonic lenses on the SL, the SL2, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and what, they're the, getting good results. Good results. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've heard good things, but I've got no personal experience. I have used a couple of the Sigma lenses okay. on the uh, SL, SL2, yeah. very good. Yeah. Um, but I can't sort of, I haven't really had a chance to shoot them at side by side and see what the differences are. So a little bit hard to answer that question. Yeah. All right, guys, look, thank you so much. Um, that's the questions that we've been, you know, we got through all of them, which is fantastic. Um, right. I'm going okay. to uh, call a quick call the proceedings to an end. Thank you all so much for your attendance and thank okay. you guys, Bill, Mark for thank turning up yeah. and, uh, and being so uh, free and open with the information sharing. So yeah, really thank you for that. Um, next week, we have um, Jesse Marlow on schedule. Uh, as the 15th, same time, same place. Uh, there should be an, uh, a newsletter going out this evening who, uh, to, to give you the link to uh, log into that. So uh, come and talk to Jesse. Same format, questions, answers, show a few pictures and so on. Um, so join me next week for that one. And I'll say goodbye for now. Bye, guys. Thanks. See you. Bye. Bye.